Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything Beatles. It could be about their past, the present, anything that comes to our mind. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other Beatles program, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts. Let's start with the man who's been writing for Beatle Fan since the very beginning of the magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also one of the other writers for Beatle Fan and a freelance writer and musicologist, we have Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also, uh, we have the man who every single day puts together news for us on Beatles Examiner. He fills us in with what's going on in the Beatle world, keeps everything up to date for us, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hello, hello, Ken. Hello, ev- hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> You're stealing my line there, Steve. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. On the program this time, we're going to do something in which we're just basically going to talk about radio. And uh, I know that uh, one of us made this suggestion to uh, discuss our memories, whatever memories we have about the Beatles growing up, 60s, solo years, whatever, our favorite memories we could share in particular that really stands out in our minds some great memories that we have related to radio. No doubt so many of our listeners have memories just like this, whether you grew up during the Beatle time in the 60s, certain things that happen on the radio, special events, maybe new releases, new albums. Maybe the Beatles came to your town and they were talking about it on the radio. And then there's all the solo stuff that followed as well. So I thought we'd each share our own particular memories, the things that probably mean the most to each of us. And so why don't we start with you, Al? Can you talk about some things? We'll talk, first of all, about the the 60s, first of all, Mm -hmm. in particular, and what stands out in your memory uh, growing up in the 60s, what great memories you have, in particular with radio. Well, uh, I'm a a radio junkie, so (laughs) I'm going to have to really keep this short or else this is going to go on for the next 18 hours. (laughs) <laughs> and but um, uh, it's something that's that's very interesting, and uh, I wrote about this in in Changing Times, and and also Bruce Spicer wrote about it in uh, in uh, the Beatles are coming. Uh, the fact that uh, and and we even did a sort of a debate on this at uh, the Fest for Beatles fans uh, back in February of tw- of uh, 2014. The fact that I've I've always felt. That despite the fact that Capital put on Capital Records put on this very large for the time uh, and very expensive publicity campaign, you know the whole Beatles are coming campaign. That really radio kind of co-opted Capital because the the momentum really began to build before the capital had much of a chance to really roll out the campaign because it was in mid in mid December that Carol James in Washington played I want to hold your hand and uh, it debuted in New York the day after Christmas 1963 and mm-hmm. and then it exploded in the first week of of January of 1964 uh and it uh and then that was it was at that point that I first heard the name, heard the word Beatles. It was uh, Tuesday night, January seventh, uh, nineteen sixty four, uh, when Scott Muni debuted the the top seven on WABC in New York, and I heard this record by this group that I had never heard of before, called uh, this record called "I Want to Hold Your Hand." Mm. And uh, and what happened in the in the weeks following that were it was absolutely amazing because it was as if this group that as I said you know most most Americans had never heard of on New Year's Day uh, within two weeks uh, they had totally were totally dominating uh, what was rapidly becoming the biggest top forty station in uh, in America. 
And Anna continued, of course, this was the era, it became the next three years, became the era of W.A. Beetle C., but also, right. but also its uh, competitors in New York, at least, well, at least the first year, WINS was still playing rock and roll. And that was, of course, spearheaded by Murray the K, who latched on to the Beatles as, uh, as, as hard as he could and uh, proclaimed himself the fifth Beatle and all of that. But uh, despite all of that self-promotion, it didn't really help all that much because within, uh, within a year... Murray had left uh, WINS, and within another two months, WINS went all news. And, mm. and then there was WMCA, which was the, the, third, uh, the third top 40 station uh, in New York. And uh, this was the era when the nighttime DJ was really, you know, as opposed to now when the morning show is the centerpiece of a station. In those days, it was the nighttime DJ. And uh, the nighttime DJ on WMCA uh, was B. Mitchell Reed, whose whose basic musical roots were really rooted more in blues and jazz. And so he took kind of a, um, you know, not he wasn't all that enthusiastic at first about the Beatles and kind of took them at uh, kind of at arms at arms length. So he didn't embrace them in the way that Scott Muni did. Scott Muni was really you know, even with all of Murray the K's self-promotion, Scott Muni was the Beatles' first radio champion in New York. Now, what do you remember? What was said initially as soon as the Beatles first got airplay? Did you hear anything about them coming to New York, being on Ed Sullivan? Mm -hmm. What were the comments that were made when the record was played for the first time or that first week or so? What do you recall about that? Well, that first week, you know, not that, re not that much really was known. You know, uh, it was uh, the first week. There really were just the, the three records, really just I Want to Hold Your Hand. And then it, almost as soon as that began taking off uh, in the first days in January, uh, VJ quickly re-released both From Me to You and Please Please Me on the same, the same disc. And then Swan re-released She Loves You. And right. so those three songs were the uh, were all that uh, you know all that we we had at that point. But and so we really didn't know that much about them. Uh, you know, it was known that they were scheduled to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show in early February, but that was really about it. There wasn't very much uh, information available regarding them. But but there was so much enthusiasm gendered by the fact that the, the by the, the uh, so much excitement I should say um, engendered by those three records that for instance at five o'clock in the afternoon every day Dan Ingram would play on this is again on WABC in New York would play would play all three Beatles records. Mm. Hmm. And that's something you know, this is something that in this day and age would never happen. You know, in this day and age where everything is computerized, where, you know, every station sounds the same and, uh, you know, they, they never emphasize, almost never emphasize any one act above another, uh, something like that would just never happen. But it was very organic. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't, as I said, I think uh, the, the radio impact really kind of short-circuited Capital's campaign, or at least co-opted it. Let me ask you something, and the rest of you can chime in on this. Mm -hmm. Because prior to the Beatles, if you take a look at, certainly from the beginning of the rock era on, there were so few British artists that broke big here. And when they did, it would only be one hit. I mean, you did have the one exception with Lonnie Donegan, who right. had Rock Island Line and uh, Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor?, which was really a novelty hit. Yeah. And then exactly. you had something like um, Telstar by the Tornadoes. Right. But was there an attitude maybe in radio that, you know, we're not going to take British artists seriously because they're basically, I mean, even Cliff Richard mm -hmm. only had one top 40 hit here in the States. Right. And that was in uh, the 70s. No, he actually had Living Doll. Oh, that's that was here. yeah, that's you right. know in yes. the '60s, but still he was nothing like he was. He was oh, no. he was the equivalent of Elvis in, in right. England. Well, but was there 
was there any kind of, I don't want to say snobbery, but was there any looking down on British artists and just not taking them seriously? Was there any sense of that that you heard in the very beginning when, when Beatles Airplay, uh, you know, happened here? I mean, you heard so much about the media always harping on the hairstyle and everything like that, not concentrating as much about the music, you know? Well, I think was that there any of that that you sensed? Well, I think that had been the difference between the the, the pre Beatles uh, British stars, because the feeling was, who needs Cliff Richard? We already have Elvis. You know, who needs Adam Faith? We already have um, you know whoever Fabian, uh, whoever. It, it was felt that the, the 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 British stars, for the most part, were just simply imitations of the American ones and in many cases they they you know they, they were a lot of them just simply covered uh records that had been had been hits here in the late 50s and and early 60s and things like uh Laurie London's uh he's got the whole world in his hand right. uh and uh, the the Lonnie Donegan hits and Telstar were really considered, and uh, Timey Kangaroo Downsport by Rolf Harris mm. were okay. really considered more novelty records than anything else. And, mm-hmm. and so there just wasn't, you know, there, there didn't seem to be a need for British, British acts to really take off here. It, but the Beatles were so different. I think too mm-hmm. the thing with the Beatles was their personalities. I yeah. mean, you had the, you know, you had the John Paul George and Ringo thing even before the Ed Sullivan Show, and people were just all over. I, I mean, I remember, and I've mentioned this I think on here before, but when I mean I first heard about them in my seventh grade class when my best friend said they were naming their their uh, half of the the class was divided into two groups and they were naming their group after the Beatles. And I, to be honest, I honestly didn't know who they were until that moment. And then, I mean, it started to fall together after that. But I mean, uh, that was in, I was in the Boston area. And of course there was a lot of, there was a lot of playing going on on, on uh, for anybody out in Boston and uh, on WMEX and yeah. WBZ. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was, I was lucky enough to, experience Beatlemania from several different parts of the country. I we moved a few years later to the New York area and I was there in sixty six when cousin Brucey gave the Order of the All American mm-hmm. to the Beatles live on the air. And I remember that night very, very well because I was I happened to be I, I like to record you know, I had a reel to reel recorder and I like to record songs off the the air and I remember they were playing Words of Love and all of a sudden they cut it off in the was it words of love or what you're doing i'm pretty sure it was words of love but anyway they cut it off in the middle and cousin brucey goes we're live at the warwick hotel with the beatles and my mouth is dropping i'm just going oh my god i'm getting this i'm getting this full recording on my on my tape recorder and which by the way you can find online it's on the abc not the Uh, the music uh music radio 77.com right right that's where it's the full. Re- I think the full recording is there. Yeah, you can hear the interview and everything. It was a great. It was a great interview between. I mean, they all kind of joked. Paul especially joked that night. I remember that very well. But as far as you know, as far as the Beatles go, I mean, uh, you know, there was so much. the The media, the media went crazy. Not only radio, but you know, TV did too. And I mean, it was just there's never. I mean. You know, you can't compare even today. I mean, Justin Bieber, you know, Taylor Swift, none of those people have had had the the media uh, saturation that the Beatles did back then. There's just no no way, you know. But the really good part was being in, in the New York area and hearing WMCA and WABC go at each other. I mean, that was just – that was – really an experience um that i you know you kind of wish that everybody could have been around because it was just great i mean you know they both tried to to rival each other they you know they were both doing things trying to get interviews and you know play play records and stuff and it was great and and uh dave hull when dave hull was here uh, on the show was telling saying the same thing was happening in la you know with KRLA and khj i mean it, it was you know that kind of thing was happening all over the country and it was just, it was just so cool that 
you know, the Beatles were so much a part of that and that radio was so much a part of that, you know. It's 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 too bad that there isn't a lot of evidence of that. It's too bad you can't put out some of those recordings or some of those air checks. Uh, they are around. There's a couple of of uh, websites that do do air checks and that have some of those Beatle things. If you look around, realradio.com, I believe, is one of them. Uh, I haven't been there for a long, long time. I think they went subscription a while back. That it used to be free, but it's not anymore. I don't think. But realradio.com does have some Beatles stuff uh, on it. Uh, I believe not actual beetle interviews but you know beetle related stuff and there's all there are there are places uh around that uh have that kind of thing but um yeah i mean there were just some great uh dj's uh um, robert w morgan uh, khj and the real don Steele were uh, were two others that uh did some great stuff back then uh they also did the monkeys too back when the monkeys came on but yeah i mean there were just some great those were great days those really were yeah, in those mm. cities that had two or three top 40 stations, there was this huge competition for who who would get the the uh the scoop of any new Beatles song. And what started happening was apparently was that one station would play a song that they had come up with, I don't know, from a Canadian single maybe or from something else. And the competing station would then tape it. So that's mm-hmm. how this whole mm-hmm. thing of, you know, first an exclusive on WABC, which would be going in and out of, you know, the premiere of a new Beatles record, you know, would would be, you know, how that uh, that originated. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, WBC, I remember, played, I think it was Beatles for Sale. Mm-hmm. You know, way before, and, and, and that had stuff, you know, that uh, that had stuff that nobody else had. And so, you know, yeah, they were playing, they were doing that. The East Coast stations were doing that stuff because they could get the the albums, you know, the easiest. You know, it was a little easier for them to get them than than the West Coast stations. You know, out in the West Coast, can can you remember when when Dave Hull was with us? He was telling Mm. us about uh, they were doing, there there was some real stuff going on in, in L.A. there between, you know, between the stations. Trying to yeah. make sure the the other one one doesn't didn't uh, um, you know uh, sneak uh, off with the other. There was just uh, and and anybody uh, interested should check out the uh, Del- Dave Hull interview we did on this on this uh, show in the archives. Uh, but yeah, uh, Alan, you're awfully quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it's funny. Um, with the very early stuff, I came in slightly late. I watched them on Sullivan. My friends were all into it. We used to, you know, hang around in each other's basement. You know, my friends had Beatles records and everything. And so we would like pick up mops and, you know, do, they didn't mm-hmm. have air guitar yet. And <laughs> we did mop guitar. Sure. Oh, you God, know, I we would, all, we would all, you know, sort of do that stuff. But, um, but my own actual musical interest at the time was really more classical music. Um, so I hung out with my friends and listened to uh-huh. Beatles records, but it, at home, I didn't do it that much. And, um, you know, but, but radio did play, a really important part in changing my mind about that because um, there's this sort of story I tell in the intro of my um, Fiden book, um, the Be- which is now called The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. I was taking piano lessons, classical piano lessons, and my teacher was one of the, her, her father had been one of the last students of Franz Liszt. And she had, you know, list cigar butts in frames on her walls and stuff like that. <laughs> Very weird, you know. <laughs> I guess it's how I got interested in memorabilia. You know? um, and one day, it was like, I guess in the spring of 64, um, I was waiting for my father to pick me up. And this car full of high school kids, it was a convertible, when driving past where I was waiting and there was a red light. So they were stopped and they're blasting. She loves you on the radio and they're all singing along and it's high school guys and girls. And I guess that, that moment was also the end of my latency period. Probably, you know, it's like, <laughs> because I, I just thought, okay, this is it. 
this is the life. You're driving around in a convertible. Girls, the Beatles, everything. You know? And so she loves you. And that, that whole thing just, I mean, that just seems so magical to me that I started listening more at that point. And then from then on, it just was, uh, you know, you couldn't get me away from the stuff. And I, then I did experience the stuff that Steve and Al were talking about with ABC and MCA. And, you know, it was great because you would come home from school. I don't know. We seem to have like a sixth sense of, of when a new Beatles record uh-huh. was coming out. Like it, yes. like it, it's been three months, you know, I think there's got to be a new one. And you start listening and you uh-huh. start going back and forth between the two stations because you never knew which one of them was going to get it first. And then they'd get it and they'd be shouting over it and you'd be listening as, as close as you could. And I had, Steve, I, <laughs> before I had a recorder, a reel-to-reel mm-hmm. recorder, I had, for some reason, a wire recorder. Does anyone know what a wire oh, wow. is? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Oh God! I have no idea why I had this. I think my um, uncle might have found it in the, you know, with his stuff, you know, in his, my grandparents' basement or something, and they gave it to me. And I had like three or four spools of recording wire, and I used to sit there and record Beatles stuff on wire. Oh, a wire wow. it was like a tape recorder, except it was very thin wire, which would oh. very easily get knotted up or break, or you know. And so I began telling my father, you know, I, I, I got, I need more wire. And he worked down um, near Chamber Street and Warren Street, which is where all of these sort of hi-fi places were. Right. And the poor guy <laughs> went walking into all of these places. This is the mid sixties already. Right. Yeah. And he said, he's looking for recording wire and he comes home and says, well, you know, I, I asked for recording wire. They look at me like I'm a Martian. Well, of course they did. Nobody yeah. was Recording wire was from what before the forties, probably, you know, so, (laughs) but he remembered it from when he was a kid. So it wasn't unnatural to him. But, um, so I recorded, I remember, um, having PSI love you on my wire recorder and, (laughs) and, uh, you know, very, uh, wavery sound, but yeah, you know, my other memories, I mean, I, I remember when they played a day in the life on either ABC or MCA for yeah. maybe a day. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it was it was months before Sergeant Pepper yeah. came out. Someone came back with an acetate or something. Mm-hmm. And they played it, and it was immediately. I mean, they got a cease and desist from e, from right. Capital, obviously. But I remember it being like, "Wow, what are they up to?" You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The last thing we had heard was, you know, you know what Revolver, Yellow Submarine, Eleanor yeah. Rigby. You know, well, we'd heard Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. So I guess we should have had an indication. But A Day in the Life was, was a bit further than that. Didn't have my wire recorder going, alas. I, I'd love to <laughs> actually – I'd love to have a tape of – of, of that early playing, you know, see exactly what they were playing, if it was finished, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, – Huh. Yeah. So uh, I guess I, I can't imagine, you know, would would ABC or MCA play a five minute track in those days? Well, you know? it was the Beatles. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, and, and I remember I remember ABC playing Strawberry Fields Forever. I mean, which isn't a yes, but it, was a, it was a weird enough track to where. And I also remember Dan Ingram complaining about it, too. But I mean, you know, they were they were really sensitive to you know to listenable stuff and when the when the beatles started to get a little crazier you know they were very they they got a little nervous about that so yeah. i hmm. do remember penny lane being played with the trumpet ending you know when it when yeah. abc I, and, and mca yeah. first played it they were playing that mm-hmm. promo yeah mm-hmm. um, i remember that too mm-hmm. yeah and so then i remember it coming out and not having it i think i was a little disappointed me too know? yeah mm-hmm. as a matter of too. fact I, I definitely was yeah. too. Yeah. In fact, I heard uh, the night before, in I don't know, sometime in like the middle of June of '65 on on WMCA, and but it was like a multi generational copy of it. It sounded like it had been recorded over the telephone or something, and I, I have mm. no idea. And of course, it you know, it, it, I think it probably lasted on the air about three hours or something before the cease and desist order came, and uh, and then didn't hear it again until you know until August when you know when the Help album finally came out. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah. I remember as well, um, I think it was WABC-FM, and I recently got a tape of this uh, to refresh my memory. Um, when WABC-FM had 10 tracks from the White Album. And yes. they were in really not great shape. And yeah. I remember them saying, you know, we're, we're going to play it now tonight, but, you know, then we're going to take it and have the tape equalized mm -hmm. and you know, it'll sound better tomorrow. But um, and I did tape that, but I didn't keep the tape um, mm. because the album came out, you know, but who knows what those mixes were. It was early and uh, only 10 tracks. Uh, one of them was everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. And they didn't call it that they called it you know something else so, you know they, they were just guessing what the titles yeah. were yeah i know? think they that i think that tape may may also be on the music radio 77 website because i was sent a copy of it like i don't know a couple of years ago i think somebody who knew that i was a fan of bob lewis who was the 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 dj who who hosted that show and yeah. uh yeah so i think it is out there the tape that's around is one of the repeats, um, one of the, like the next day or, or so. Yeah. A bit later. Um, I have that Bob Lewis one too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting also hearing his, uh, his analysis, yeah. you know, mm. the, uh, you know the, the Beatles jamming and, you know, stuff like that. But, but, you know, it was only like, 10 songs and uh you know it was it was it was great having it for a few weeks before the record came out and yeah. uh I, I think it was mono mixes and the same with get back what became the let it be album i mean mm -hmm. those tracks were around for ages i mean yeah. capital must have been keeping its lawyers extremely busy with cease and desists because there was uh, well wbcn right. uh, had a, a played the whole uh, acetate of um, mm -hmm. the Glyn Johns mix and I guess the New York stations may have gotten it from that I remember hearing it on uh, again WABC FM mm -hmm. uh, sometime in I'd say November of 69 because I can remember hearing it uh, I was at a, at a you know a high school a local high school dance and talking to guys in the band and they were uh, they were playing it on the uh, you know on their on their their you know their speaker system. Yeah, I I, see, I vaguely I seem to remember hearing it before Abbey Road came out. Oh yeah, because then Abbey Road yeah. came out, and it's well, but this isn't. How can this be the new album? The yeah. last well didn't even come out yet. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and and they the New York State FM stations played you know, two or three different versions of Let It Be by the time the thing finally came out. Yeah. And I had taped those too. Those I think I might have kept. Also taped all of those um, Howard Smith interviews. Yes. Oh, wow. In fact, I yeah. uh, heard, uh, I remember hearing the interview that he did with Dave Morrell. That's right. Um, on, you know, the night that it ran. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I did too. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I taped it, but I think my tape ran out uh, because I don't have the whole interview and the right. only bootlegs that are out there, I, I believe, come from my tape because they all end in the same <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> But now they put them out officially. So Yeah. Uh, right. But um, yeah. So those are great. Uh, you know, later on, I mean, I heard Dennis Ells is having John Lennon on. I, I didn't hear yeah. Scott Muni's John, John Lennon interview until years later. Yeah. And that was a, a lot, you know, not nearly as interesting. Yeah, that's true. Which is funny because they were sort of, they, you know, they kind of knew each other for yeah. a long time. They were sort of friends, you know, um, it's, it's funny that it wasn't that interesting, but what can mm. you do? Yeah. So, you know, the funny, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, the whole Beatles radio thing. I mean, it's a, a very sort of vivid part of my, uh, you know, childhood into adolescence and, um, you know, just the whole thing of, of coming home and, and going back and forth between the two stations when you thought there's probably something coming out. And, you know, you probably did that for weeks and weeks before yes. you really heard something. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that was it was an exciting time because, you know, now we know all the stuff, but we didn't know it then. We never knew what we were going to hear. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Mm. Uh, yeah. 
you know, suddenly it was Lady Madonna and I, wow, what's that, that whole piano thing? That's kind yeah, of unlikely. Right. You know, yeah. which was definitely, you know, a, a definitely a, like a left hand or right hand turn from, you know, mm-hmm. Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah, I remember also hearing um, Revolution for the first time. Yeah. And really was it, you know, I didn't catch the, um, I guess, the announcement of what it was going to be. I just, my might have turned on in the middle of it, and, mm-hmm. and it sounded kind of like John to me, but they had never put anything that rocky out before. Mm. And I remember thinking, yeah, I wonder what what the Beatles would think of this, you know, and then they announced it. So like, I guess they like it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then, Hey Jude, you know, that this thing's going on endlessly. And, uh, yeah, it was always a surprise. It was always a surprise and it was always a great surprise. It was, you know, I don't remember ever feeling like, I don't really like this one. You know, it was mm. like everything was an adventure and it was always like, okay, I, I can go there. This is great. <laughs> so, solo that's, stuff. That's I don't really, really um, you know, I probably wasn't listening by then, you know, to, well, no, I was. I mean, the early Lennon stuff, I was a lot. McCartney stuff in those days of the sort of just post Beatles transition, it was, it was very polarized. And Paul was putting out, I kind of liked Another Day. I hated Admiral Halsey. Uncle Albert, I that's, hated that's surprising. <laughs> Mary had a little lamb. I mean, to me, it was just all like, uh, you know, obvi- okay, so obviously the brains of the operation was John. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> that's but how I, you thought back then? That's how I thought back then, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it was very, you know, you, you, me and my friends, it was sort of like all, uh, you know, you were either a John guy or a Paul guy, and... Um, no, I, I like John's stuff a lot better at that point, and uh, it's just the way it was, you know. I mean, when then Band on the Run came out, it's like, okay, okay, maybe he does have it still, you know. Um, <laughs> Boy, you're then, being rather harsh. <laughs> well, I'm just saying what, what my feeling yeah, at what the time as a kid thought. was. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I listen to yeah. the albums before that now, um, you know, much more willingly, even... Even Wildlife, which I absolutely loathed when it came out. I mean, you know, Bip-Bop was really just giving everybody ammunition. But, you know, I like Wildlife now. I mean, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's at a particular stage in his career, and you, you kind of have to think of it in those terms. And in those days, I wasn't thinking in those terms. I was thinking of, okay, this is what each of them are putting out, and I like this and I don't like that, Right. you know? Mm-hmm. Ringo didn't get much airplay in those days. You didn't get Bukoops of Blues on the radio or Sentimental Journey very oh, much. Sure. Oh, sure. Well, not Sentimental Journey, but certainly It Don't Come Easy got it a lot of airplay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And then back That's off right. Boogaloo. Yeah. And George, so. you know, I remember ABC FM was, or maybe by then they were PLJ. PLJ yeah. You know, they used to play a lot of All Things Must Pass, and um, and that was great stuff. But, yeah. Anyway, but but my strongest memories really are of the group stuff, you know. That was what I would sit there and listen for. I, I don't remember sort of sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for a solo album to come out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the flip side of that. <laughs> now, actually, you seem to have a lot of memories tied to radio there, Alan. That's great. But as far as, you know, the 60s are concerned, I was pretty young back then, but I still vividly remember... 1964 and just hearing nonstop Beatles all the time on the radio. Mm -hmm. I wasn't um, listening to analyze between WABC and WMCA what was going on. To me, it was just fun radio. And most of the time, I listened to WABC. I mean, that station was my life in the 60s and the 70s. (laughs) Sure. And uh, not just because of the music, but because of the DJs. And uh, they made it all fun. And Mm -hmm. all the DJs were different in their own way. They all had their own style. And in 64, like you were saying, Al, it was radio saturation. And I just yeah. remember hearing one Beatles song after another, and I had a little transistor radio that I kept glued to my ear, and I loved it. I was just totally immersed in all the music of that time, but especially the Beatles. 
and uh, just being exposed to all that music. As a little kid, I was pretty up on everything that the Beatles released, even though I wasn't aware of if they were ever on the radio talking, being interviewed. I wasn't really following that because I guess I was too young to really be that observant at the time of that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But as the records came out, I had the singles and the albums or one of my aunts used to, to buy me Beatles stuff. So I pretty much had everything close to when they were released. But um, I remember very well when Hey Jude came out, hearing it on one station, turning to another Top 40 station and hearing the Na Na Hey Hey's, you know, hearing the beginning of the song mm-hmm. on one and, and, you know, hearing the Na Na's, the Na Na Hey Hey's on another station, you know, just, just, you know, to see how Hey Jude just completely dominated the charts back then. But nothing like you guys have said can ever compare to 1964 and what happened on the radio back then. And it wasn't just the Beatles. It was, um, you know, you, you had to add a lot of the other stuff that we we either knew at the time or later discovered were Lennon McCartney songs given mm-hmm. to Peter and Gordon and sure. Billy J. Kramer and those people and the whole British invasion thing. It was a really magical time, you know, yeah. and it's really fascinating, you know, what you said, Alan, and it is so true and it may seem very obvious that when has there ever been a time when on hit radio a group would put out a new single say every three months <laughs> yeah or every four months and sometimes it might be two singles from the same album but then you knew there'd be something entirely new that you never heard before and it, it just kept gushing out for a long period of time and it wasn't until like the the later 60s 67 there were three singles that year from the Beatles in 68 there were two so they were slowing down with the singles but still those early years were just amazing as far as top 40 was concerned and um, you know my my biggest memory of anything at all connected with the Beatles is one that you mentioned Alan and that is when um, John Lennon was on Dennis Elsus's show Mm -hmm. because that was that that could be my favorite interview I've ever heard from any of them I mean, there are, there are some that are more um, intense from John, especially the one uh, he gave to David Wigg in 1971, which is, mm. you know, probably my favorite of all of John's interviews. Extremely powerful interview. Very bitter at that time, but, you know, he was speaking his mind. But in 74 with Dennis, it was promoting Walls and Bridges, the new album at the time. But he also got John to open up about a lot of things about the Beatles that we never heard before. And apart from the fact that it was, you know, just a great interview, John was so funny <laughs> and yeah. he was so naturally mm-hmm. funny. I mean, I, I've interviewed Dennis and, and Steve and I have interviewed Dennis about uh, that interview. And I said to him, you know, that interview is just too good to be true. The yeah. timing of it. It's not just the fact that John was, you know, so uh, such a great personality on the air and so naturally funny. But look at the look at the timing of it all. There were commercials that they were they were plugging for uh, Good Night Vienna at that time. Right. I mean, the, the, right. the last quarter of 1974, you had all that solo Beatles stuff. There was even the Mahavishnu Orchestra produced by George Martin. You know, <laughs> com- coming out of it's like it was you. Is this a setup? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> how can how could it be more perfect? And then you can just you know talk about George Martin for a while if you wanted to do that. And um, he was so funny just reading the weather, uh, you know, telling Mm -hmm. Beatles stories and enlightening us on stuff we never heard about before, you know, like using um, using a reggae arrangement in that that solo part. And I call your name, Mm -hmm. which was really, you know, ahead of its time on a pop record, really. And uh, the whole bit about the Bobby Parker record, Watch Your Step, which influenced Day Tripper. And I feel fine. Actually, more I feel fine. Yeah. But there's a little bit in in Watch Your Step, if you listen very carefully, where the riff from Day Tripper, you can hear a little bit of that in there, too. Mm. But just hearing all that and, and to know that John was aware of ELO, you know, mm. at the time mm-hmm. and to play Showdown uh, on, on the interview. And, um, you know, it was a really cool interview. And, and Dennis... Deserves a lot of credit for for getting so much out of John during that interview. It was a a very magical one, you know, just on all levels, you know, and to learn stuff about the new album. So, and I happened to be listening when that happened. 
a friend of mine told me, hey, you got to turn on NEW, John's mm -hmm. on. So I yeah. missed the first few minutes, but I heard it when it was happening. And it still is. It's one of those few interviews where I, I've memorized so much of the lines. Sure. Kind of like, you know, we, we memorize a hard day's night yeah. and help and, mm -hmm. and lines and that. There's a lot that John said in that interview that, you know, I can recite. So uh, that was that was a, uh, you know, a great time. Oh, I was going to say the Howard Smith interviews, by the way, are coming out in book form. Um, right. Um, I just mm -hmm. wrote about that uh, last week or the week before. So, um, yeah, that'll be handy to have. You can look stuff up. Mm -hmm. But but the interviews themselves, I mean, John's interviews were just so great in terms of, you know, the personality that comes through and mm -hmm. uh, and those Howard Smith interviews, too, because, you know, he would um, he would turn up at their house while they were having, say, uh, ABC was having a, an all Beatles day. And so you would hear the radio on in the background and sometimes John would turn it up and listen to this for a couple of seconds and, and then start talking about the song, you know, mm -hmm. that was, I mean, that was just great. That was probably the same one that Dave Morrell turned up on uh, mm -hmm. that show, mm -hmm. you know, but also, you know, the, the Howard Smith one started out with much shorter interviews because I think that, I think he started and Zachary too on NEW at the same time around the time of the bed ins in Toronto. Yeah. You know, John was talking to everybody and everybody who could get him on the phone was broadcasting mm -hmm. the interview. So I sat there with my reel to reel recorder going crazy, you know. It was like, okay, let's see who's got one now, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and that yeah. all that stuff I kept. I mean, eventually I sort of realized that you can't erase them. <laughs> Same thing I mean, with those... me with uh, cassette tapes. I used to tape yeah. a lot of interviews over the radio, mm -hmm. a lot of interviews with, with the solo Beatles. Yeah. One thing to mention, um, you know, particularly for the, the first generation people, is that the the whole British invasion thing was just completely insane, you know, in 64. And actually, it, you kind of get a, a little feeling of that now with the uh, revital, with the, um, the return of the zombies recently. You know, I mean, that kind of you know any british group was was gold back then you know i mean you had the mm -hmm. dave clark five the animals the the hollies i mean there were just so many you know there were some peter and gordon um you know we've we've talked with peter asher you know i mean it's just uh, chat and jeremy i mean there were just so many there was just so much going on back in those days and and it was just a such a wonderful time and uh, I don't know how people feel about the '60s, but I, I I really think that the music back then was it was unbeatable. I mean, you can't get any better than that stuff. Sorry, sorry, Ken, but <laughs> I mean, it, it, we're just really we're really giving it to you about that. <laughs> well, I, you know, I guess well, I, you know, I think everybody feels that the music that they kind of grew up with mm -hmm. is the best. You know, uh, I'm sure I, I know there are people that grew up in the '80s. Mm -hmm. And feel that the you know that the eighties music is you know is unbeatable the the uh even strange as it may seem, there are people that grew up in the nineties that you know that are very mm -hmm. nostalgic about that stuff, and I'm sure it'll be the same thing with uh, the kids that are now listening to you know Taylor Swift and you know yeah, but Al, stuff. objectively speaking, <laughs> we grew up with the Beatles. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we oh yeah, and we got we were very spoiled, you know, not only with the Beatles but also with the Who and Dylan and, and oh, the yeah. Stones and and everything yeah. else. So so I you know I've always I I absolutely feel that we grew up in a very special time, and mm -hmm. uh, and that the you know that the 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 especially the historical quality of the music of that time is pretty much is pretty much unbeatable but mm -hmm. you know other people obviously are going to feel you know just that the music was you know what they what they kind of grew up with that's what they feel most comfortable with well just to clarify something here mm. i have i have the deepest appreciation for the music of the 60s i love the 60s and just what i've found not only with the 60s but with a lot of the decades my appreciation has grown even more for older music and my favorite decade has always been the 70s, but it's not just because my teenage years were the 70s. I genuinely think that that was a renaissance period, as was the 60s. And I don't like all this constant comparison, which is better. I love it all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just great music still continued. It's only when people start saying, well, it was never the same after the 60s. 
you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I can point to from the 70s and 80s that I think was absolutely beyond amazing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I will never deny the greatness of the 60s. So don't ever group me into this thing where, you know, I'm, I'm all post 60s. I love it all. You know, it's with me, it's more an appreciation of everything instead of just singling out one thing, you know, and where the solo Beatles are concerned, I still contend that they still put out great songs on their own that never stopped. You know, they didn't have to have each other just to put out great music. They still continued putting out great music on their own. And sometimes we should just not be so concerned about which is the best. Just mm -hmm. that there's great music out there for everyone sure. to appreciate. So there you go. There's my yeah. rant. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, when you, re when you really think about it, the 70s are actually probably a more diverse, uh, was a, you know, the, the, that era musically was probably more diverse than the sixties were because you had, it was like, it was, it was like the wild west musically because almost it was like anything goes any, you know, right. any, any kind of any particular genre was, you know, whether it was glam rock or, uh, you know, or, or heavy metal or, you know, kind of teeny bopper pop or act disco, uh, or, <laughs> You know, or the you know early new wave and punk rock, things like that, and then that just scratches the surface. You know, there's there's prog rock, there's uh, there's the kind there is sort of the kind of symphonic rock, that Moody Blues and ELO were doing, yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. and on and on. So uh, so you know when you really think about it, the 70s, we're probably a more diverse time, but uh, That's really true, yeah. But the you know and, the sixties were when the the barriers that kind of uh, the barriers fell that led the way to all of right. that diversity. Mm -hmm. I would make a strong case for um, eighteen oh four to eighteen twenty seven and eighteen ninety nine to nineteen twenty. <laughs> um, but that's in my other life. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> that was that was very well put, Al. You know, I mean, I couldn't have said it any better, really, because that's what I love the most about the 70s is this wide range of music. I mean, this explains between the Beatles and Top 40 radio growing up in the 60s and 70s. I was exposed to every kind of genre of music. Wow. And I wasn't one of those people who said, I only like the rock and roll. You know, I was I was listening to, uh, you know, the Osmonds, One Bad Apple and a whole lot of love from Led Zeppelin on the same station sure. and liking them both. Uh -huh. So. That also explains, I mean, if you go into the Beatles catalog, you've got something as heavy as Helter Skelter and Revolution, and then you go right to um, Honey Pie, right. you know, and when you're exposed to all that, you know, you either develop a, a you know, deep appreciation like I have, or you just go in one direction and just like one thing. And I was never one of, one of those people because I was, I was hit with all this music all at once. And then there's so much music that I appreciated much more later on one of the things that i liked a bit in the 70s that i love to death now is all the philadelphia soul that came out of the 70s you know the ojs and stuff like that i love that music harold melvin and the blue notes there's so much that came out of that decade you know from the bubblegum to the to the heavy rock to the progressive rock to the singers songwriters the james taylors and you know and then there's all the solo beatle stuff mm -hmm. and stevie wonder stevie wonder what he put out in the 70s was beyond amazing as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. so um you know i mean that's that's what radio has had as an effect on me you know so um yeah and also going into the the solo beatles stuff with radio there's all the radio specials the interview shows the off the records mm -hmm. um rock line was was exciting even though sometimes you couldn't get too in depth mm. with uh, any of the beatles it was pretty surface stuff but um one favorite memory of mine is when George Harrison was on Rockline when mm -hmm. Cloud Nine came out and Jeff Flynn joined them and they did this whole medley with Everly Brothers stuff. And, you know, it, it was really wonderful, you know, and when you're listening to it live as it's happening, that makes it even the more special. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that I miss a lot about radio in general is the live aspect of it. And a lot of people don't care about that anymore, a lot, especially a lot of young people, mm -hmm. you know, in this mm -hmm. on demand world that we live in. So, um, yeah, that made it even the more exciting to me. Uh, things like the, the Beatles at the Beep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, although a lot of that stuff wasn't live as it was happening. Well, yeah. It was still, sure. you know, it was still exciting at the time. Mm -hmm. It was only maybe, you know, in some cases a week apart or a few days before 
you know, between when it was recorded and when it was broadcast. Mm -hmm. So I I remember uh, Dave talking about uh, um, how do you do it? I remember mm -hmm. uh, Dave uh, uh, talking about that. And I remember sitting in the, in my car in the, in the, cold weather waiting for that thing to come on the radio because i you know when they did said you they first were, hear that you know i don't remember seems to me it would probably i remember where i was living so it would have to be in the 70s sometime yeah uh, i think uh, I, new played it once in one of their beatles a to z things yeah. um mm. and it it was the early 70s and i remember i remember being I, uh, offended isn't the right word but it was like wait a minute there cannot mm. exist a Beatles record that I don't have. Yeah, what is right. that doing on the radio? You know, uh, I knew what it was because we'd all read about how they recorded it and didn't want mm -hmm. it out. And, and um, but well, that was when well, I guess I discovered bootlegs. You I, know? Think, I remember KFRC telling everybody that they were going to play the song, and they and and they did, and they introduced it. And and uh, somewhere I have a tape of the of what they played. I don't and how they introduced it, but. I remember them playing it and I was just, you know, they didn't play it very often. So, I mean, they went several hours between playing it and you never knew exactly when they were going to play it. And they finally played it and it was, it was like, wow, you know, this is fantastic. Uh, it was great. So they must I have been playing it off the, off the bootleg single that came out. Around yeah, that, I think, that, which I, yeah, I think, I think so. which I think Joe Pope. That's right. Uh, had a role in at least a, a role in putting it out. I'm not sure it I may think, have been. I think this was before the single. I I I, I seem to remember it, it coming out before the single because I remember seeing the single, and in fact, all those Decagon records uh, in Berkeley, mm -hmm. and buying them. I remember they were they were like six bucks a piece, I believe, and I remember buying them all at once. Um, but uh, I believe I, uh, I believe How Do You Do It was on the air before that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty positive. So. And then there was also uh, the first uh, BBC radio special, or it was all BBC recordings. Right. Wasn't that around 1981? Uh, I, think I think 82. 82. 82. That was the, okay. that was, uh, the Beatles at the Beeb uh, Memorial Day weekend of 82. Mm -hmm. Oh, which God. Was, that was, which that, was, was uh, that was an event. Yeah, for the capital. It was an event, and it was it was kind of an interesting event if you were a bootleg collector because yes. you not only had a lot of those tracks, but remember, you know, bootlegs all came from different quality tapes, yes. and sometimes mm -hmm. there'd be a little buzz in one, and and so you could tell which bootlegs they were using mm -hmm. because some of them, you know, were bootlegs. I mean, they were they were very open about it that they had erased their tapes and that yeah. they. Uh, you know, they solicited, they basically put out an ad uh, in The Listener, which was the BBC's uh, magazine, saying, well, you may remember when these shows were on, we told you that um, we didn't want people taping them. But if you happen to have, could you get in touch with us? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but otherwise, they used boots, too. And uh, it was, a, you know, and, if, and if, then the next time they did the show, newer tapes turned up and they replaced mm -hmm. the boots mm -hmm. with the buzzes with you yeah. know fresher ones and mm -hmm. and so those shows became a source of new material for all of us collecting it too and around that time rip rents did the series in the herald examiner about that about the yeah. bbc That's stuff right. and that was a that was a landmark series you know because nobody a lot of people didn't learn about or learned about that stuff from that, you know, from that series, and that mm. of course got everybody interested in it. So, and and just a few years later, a show that I know Ken is all too familiar with, the Lost yeah. London Tapes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a, what a treasure that was. Sure. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, I love every aspect of that show. Um, the fact that every single week there's something there that you didn't hear. And even if it's not, I mean, to me, the most the, the most interesting thing is a, is a composition that you never heard before. But if you hear a, an alternate take or a different mix or an interview clip that you never heard before, and there was always something week to week that you never heard. And um, that just made it so fascinating to me. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, between bootlegs and hearing a show like that, when you hear alternate takes, when you hear different versions of songs, it it makes you... It gives you more interest and it makes you appreciate the music even more. 
-hmm. when you hear different versions and, you know, maybe you pick up on something in the song that you never heard before. To this day now, I I just love demos to death, you know, because Mm -hmm. you get to see songs in their infancy and, you know, there's so many changes that could take place from that moment to the finished product and all that I find fascinating. And uh, like I said, you know, when a, a show like that was was just really, you know, you heard so many early versions of songs that John later released. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, later on, it was it was bootlegged on vinyl and on CD without Elliot Mintz's voice in there. And you just had the songs. And, you know, I treasure a lot of that stuff, especially the songs that John didn't release. A lot mm-hmm. of the um, the late 70s stuff that was supposed to be in the that musical that he and Yoko apparently right. were uh-huh. planning about. Yeah. You know, I love that stuff. Whatever well, happened plus, to those songs. That yeah. show gave us the first listen to the Esher demos for the White Album. That was really important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That wasn't available on boot before then? No, no. That was wow. the, and, and basically it was from the, um, you know, Yoko had given them all their tape, all of her tape archive and they cataloged it. And the first complete batch of the Isher tapes leaked out from there. It wasn't even all broadcast. It was um, someone managed to get a copy out of Westwood One and and put it out on that on, on one of those Lost Lennon tapes bootlegs, the one with the. Um, the Richard Avedon cover, you remember? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean that was a that was quite a haul. When that show was, I mean, by the time that was going on, I was sort of like in my adult professional life. So I interviewed Yoko, I interviewed Elliot Mintz, you know, before it all happened, mm. and um, and it was you know interesting, and and also Steve Peoples, who was the person at Westwood One who was putting it together. Mm. Uh, and it was really interesting hearing about, you know, what their plans were because they had just done a few by the time I did the interviews and it was, you know, the piece was coming out before the sort of introductory three hour show. So, yeah, I mean, you, you didn't know what that show was going to be, but it went on for what, like 219 episodes. Mm -hmm. That's a lot Mm -hmm. of material. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I had the privilege of playing it on the air because I was on WDHA in New Jersey exactly. at the time. Right. And I was on from 7 in the morning till 10 with my show. And then the Lost Lennon Tapes was on at 6 o'clock. So mm-hmm. I had a lot of people waking up very early. <laughs> mm-hmm. One of whom was and, me. And, and, and no doubt recording that show and then listening to me. I benefited from that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I even made I even did a lot of radio specials based on material from that show. So, uh, yeah, I loved it. You know, I sort of lucked out there. I never actually had to listen to Lost Lennon tapes on the radio because <laughs> they sent me the discs. <laughs> mm. Oh, wow. Oh, that was really nice. Where they remain the same. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's uh, when I moved to Maine, the day that our movers were there, they were taking all the boxes out and stuff. And the next morning, one of our neighbors came by and said, uh, you know, it was one of your boxes of records was out on the street and I brought it into the lobby and it was one whole box of lost Lennon tapes. Those would have been irreplaceable. Oh, my God. Yeah, how they managed to survive a night on a New York street corner without someone taking them, I have no idea, but yeah. There's there's one other thing about radio, and I've always been a chart buff. You know, mm. I've memorized how far singles go, how far how far albums go. Certainly with the Beatles, I have it, you know, I'm pretty much almost 100% accurate when it comes to those things. And I used to write down every single week the top 40 charts and listen to American Top 40 with Casey Kasem and always rooting for the solo Beatles single of the time to, you know, climb up the charts. So those were exciting times. And to know which ones went to number one, which ones went to number, you know, went in the top 10. An exciting time was 1976 when you had Wings having their hits at the same time that Got to Get You Into My Life was a top 10. Mm-hmm. single you know stuff like that i remember so well and um listening to american top 40 every single week which like i said exposed me to so many different styles of music at the time and uh you know seeing how well the solo beatles were doing which sometimes a lot of people aren't aware of the success that the beatles had on their own and if you just take a look at the the charts and you take a look at uh, the facts You'd be surprised how many top 10 hits and number ones they had on, on their solo careers, in oh, their solo mm-hmm. careers. Mm-hmm. 
Oh yeah, especially the period from you know from 1970, let's say through 76. That was yeah. You know, that was an amazing. I mean, you know, they had you know they had successes after that, but certainly in that those six years, they had an uh, an amazing amount of success. Yeah, well, remember a big factor was that John retired. You know, yes, after ninety, so you didn't have him there from seventy six through seventy nine, right? To go along with all the other solo stuff at that time. So right, but yeah. also, but also Ringo's career kind of went into decline after seventy six. That's true. That's yeah. true. We talked about that. So yeah, but those are those are memories that I keep with me, and um, you know, American Top Forty with Casey Kasem was a, a very big part of my life, and you know, thankfully that show, archival shows are being syndicated now. Sure. And um, I listened to some of those old shows. In fact, Casey answered one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> did he really? So, yes, he did. I remember it to this day. <laughs> what was it? What was your question? Well, this was 1976, and I wanted to know who was the most successful um, artist as far as who who had the most chart albums without ever having a single on the Hot 100. Hmm. Yoko. And no one, no one, no <laughs> one, <laughs> no one amongst you would ever get it. And keep in mind that this may have changed since this was 1976 when when it aired. Hmm. But um, yeah, the answer was Jim Neighbors. Uh, well, I, would, I would never have guessed that. No, never, yeah, never. not in a million years. So yeah, golly, Casey said, Casey said my name on American Top Forty. Wow, <laughs> woo, woo. You were that's famous. my brush with fame. Yay. Aside from working with you guys, that is. Oh. Yeah. For anybody that <laughs> for anybody that's interested in chart, uh, there are some books out there. All the Joel Whitburn stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I recently got a hold of the Guinness uh, Hit Singles Albums book, the British book. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you look on Amazon, you can get them relatively cheaply. Mm -hmm. The Whitburn books books are a little more expensive. Oh, they're a lot more expensive. (laughs) The Guinness books are are pretty cheap. Yeah. um, Which is surprising. And that has all the British... uh, chart stuff and, and it's fascinating just to look through there i mean that's kind of the kind of stuff that i refer to a lot when i'm writing but i mean it's fascinating to look through and especially the british stuff because the british uh you know the a lot of the british artists that charted and and, and hit big are not the same people that we know over here oh sure and, and so it's fascinating to see some of those names you know, over there that, that were, I mean, the Bay City Rollers, for example, are one, uh, even though we know who they are over here, Mm -hmm. they were much bigger over there than they were over here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, that's just, and that's not even a good example, really. I mean, there's just a lot of, I have the book sitting here, but I'm not going to take the time and go through it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, so that's, if you're really interested in that stuff, that's a good, and there's also a couple of, of uh, radio books, I know Ben Fong Torres did a, a radio book. All right, I can't. And the hits keep coming. Is mm-hmm. that? Right? Yeah, and the hits uh, and the hits just keep on coming. And there's a couple of other books too. And there, and I know PBS did a radio special. I mean, a, P, a TV special on it a couple of years ago. But yeah, I mean, the whole thing, the whole radio issue of, you know, especially in the '60s, is just fascinating. So there are all sorts of ways to explore it. Yeah. It is it is fascinating to me what songs were hits in America that weren't hits in the UK. Mm-hmm. Not just the Beatles stuff and the solo Beatles stuff, mm-hmm. but you know, artists who charted in, in both countries and vice right. versa. Songs yeah. that were big hits there that weren't hits here. You know, so uh and also songs that were never released as singles here. Like, you know, we've talked about certain Beatles singles like Eight Days a Week, you mm-hmm. know, that were never a single in the UK or The Long and Winding Road or Nowhere Man or those songs. So I find all that fascinating too. Mm-hmm. And that and that brings up a, a, a point that I'm gonna that I'm gonna probably get shot for saying, but the eight days a week video in the new DVD is awesome. The Shea footage looks tremendous. Mm. Enough. <laughs> yeah, we we were talking. Before. We'll talk about that next week, all yeah. of us. Yes, uh, we will. We were talking we will. a little bit before we before we began recording, and Alan and Steve, who have had, who have had access to the one plus both the cd and the dv and the dvds mentioned that 
it's you know there maybe there's a possibility that uh, because of the quality of the eight days a week video and and I'm forgetting the other one. Um, Harris. Yes. The, Harris yes. The, right. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know that may be kind of a teaser for the uh, the Ron Howard directed uh, film that will be coming out. I guess sometime next year. Mm -hmm. The or the Shea film that they should put out. In yeah, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh God. Yeah, that looks so good. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, enough All about right. that. All right, that's a wrap on this show. If any of you would like to get in touch with us, you can do so at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. You can also uh, get in touch with us on Facebook at uh, things we said today and also on Twitter at what's the address, Steve? Things we said fab. You can't remember that, can you? No, I can't. <laughs> hey, you, you, you've got. <laughs> that's all right. You've got your young, own young enough to like there, disco, Steve. old enough to not remember the name. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, that's that's all there is to me. I just like disco, nothing else, right? Oh, okay. All right. Right. Okay. <laughs> You're just gonna give people this impression of me <laughs> in every single show now, I guess. Oof. Also, if you would like to get in touch with me, Ken Michaels, if you want to talk Beatles or disco, then you can write at. <laughs> Every little thing at att.net. You can also catch my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And funny, we should mention the Beatles One Plus because hopefully by the time this is posted, if not a few days later, I'll be giving away copies of that on my website in a special contest. So that's at kenmichaelsradio.com. Al, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Uh, at Facebook under Al Sussman or through Twitter uh, at a sus a s u s s four nine, or more directly through uh, Beetlefan www.beetlefan.com or uh, www.paradingpress.com. And Alan, how about you? Uh, the easiest way is probably at, uh, Facebook, um, it just either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. Also, um, I, I, if I can plug my uh, review of the One, one Plus uh, set, um, it's coming out or will have come out by the time this is heard and on the Wall, in the Wall Street Journal. You can find it on WSJ.com. And, uh, or you could just email me directly at alancozen at gmail.com. All right. And you, Steve? Um, you can get me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I'm on, a, if you search examiner.com for my name, you'll find me all over the place because I do columns not only on the Beatles, but on, on vintage music and TV and all sorts of stuff. And um, I also have an ebook. I'm going to plug my ebook. Um, it's not about the Beatles. It's about Davy Jones, uh, my two interviews with Davy Jones, um, and it's called Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. It's on Amazon, and it's on Barnes & Noble and several other places. So there we okay. go. All right, great. This has been wonderful, sharing our radio memories of the Beatles, group and solo. I'm Ken Michaels. Thanks so much for listening, and on behalf of Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and Steve Marinucci, thanks again for tuning in, and we will see you next time.